Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, before starting, I wanted to uh, tell you that at any time uh, you can ask me a question in the chat uh, on the chat on your on your go to webinar screen. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, lidar data and uh, concepts of virtual surveying. So uh, my name, as Amber has said, is Anthony Belil, and I'm here to sp I'm here speaking to you from uh, the GeoPlus office, which is in the Montreal area. Uh, just to say a, th a few things about myself, uh, I hold I have a bachelor degree in geomatics applied to the environment, and I have over four years of experience working in the lidar industry in both data, data collection and data calibration. So, well, GeoPlus. Uh, GeoPlus has been developing software for land surveyors and civil, civil engineers for 29 years now. Uh, we have substantial budgets in research and development. Um, and now LiDAR, as LiDAR is a new technology on the market, uh, we've been offering LiDAR software solutions for three years now, but we've also been researching uh, LiDAR solutions for five years. Um, before starting, we'll have a quick summary of uh, the presentation today. First of all, what is LiDAR data? Uh, different types of LiDAR. Um, common uses of LiDAR for land surveyors, um, virtual surveying concepts, uh, demonstrations of virtual surveying. I'm going to show you a few concepts of virtual surveying with the, the program uh, called Vision LiDAR. And that if you have any questions at the end, it would be a good time, but also as I said, uh, during the presentation would be an adequate time as well. So, first of all, what is LiDAR data? Um, first of all, it's very similar to radar. Now, radar, most people have heard about radar before. Uh, radar is used to detect airplanes in the sky. Uh, radar is used to detect weather. Well, we use uh, radar waves to detect humidity in the sky and see if there's any droplets of water for example. Uh, radar can be used to detect speeding cars to detect their, their velocity. Um, radar means uh, radio detection and ranging. Now similar to radar, uh, LiDAR means light detection and ranging. So instead of using radio waves, we're using light waves. Uh, a LiDAR sensor is going to emit and receive light signals. Uh, and the light signals are higher than the visible light spectrum. This means when we have a LiDAR scanner going, uh, we won't be able to see the, the beam on the, on the object that's being surveyed. What's great about LiDAR is that it gives you a 3D representation of an area. Uh, the, the, everything surveyed will have not only an X and a Y, every LiDAR point will have an X and Y coordinate, but also a Z coordinate to give you a vertical um, coordinate as well. The end result is going to be a point cloud. This is what we call the whole data of uh, of, of our LiDAR uh, when we can visualize it in uh, 3D. So one other thing that's good about LiDAR is it can be classified to different classes. This way, for example, buildings could be classified to building class and you can put trees or any type of vegetation to a vegetation class. This way, if you have different analysis if you want to only analyze the surface of buildings, you can do so, or remove tr the trees from for your analysis. You can ana an analyze the ground, for example, it can be very useful. Um, also, 
So one other thing about LiDAR data is it's been it, more and more it's replacing photogrammetry. Photo, what is photogrammetry? Um, it's similar to uh, it's similar to LiDAR in that it's used it's used to uh, measure sorry it's used to measure uh, we use photos to measure distances between objects however photogrammetry only has uh, only uses light uh, from the photo however it doesn't give you a Z value LiDAR is more interesting in that it gives you also a Z uh, one last thing about LiDAR data is that you can virtual surveying can be done. Virtual surveying is, for example, measuring within the point cloud and and picking points, for example, and vectorizing vectorizing information and objects on the point cloud. So, for example, if you do a LiDAR survey, you don't and you won't have to return to the field if you have forgotten any measurements. In particularities about LiDAR. Um, first of all is the intensity image. Um, the, the intensity is based in part on the reflectivity of the object. Uh, dark objects will reflect, uh, will have higher intensity values and uh, lighter objects will have uh, lower intensity values. Uh, one other thing that's good or great about LiDAR is you can survey at night, so you don't need the, the, the light of the sun, for example, whereas in photogrammetry or photo aerial photography, uh, you, would need, you would need it to, to be during the day. Uh, one other thing I'm going to show you a bit later are blind spots. Uh, this is something that's, that can be... Uh, bothersome. For example, if you're doing an aerial survey, you won't be able to see underneath bridges because the, the light beam won't be able to travel underneath. Uh, won't be able to catch the underneath of a structure. Um, reflective surfaces such as water or glass or mirrors will be difficult if impossible to capture because the light beams will will reflect directly off and will never return to the sensor. In this way, uh, water is very difficult to capture with LiDAR. Um, another thing, leaf off or leaf on conditions. This is important in LiDAR because if you are surveying, for example, a forested area, if it's leaf off, it will be, it will be much more interesting to the user uh, because it will be easier to capture, the light beams will be, be able to capture the ground more easily. Uh, for example, leaf on would be the trees having all their leaves. It would be easier if you want to, uh, for example, analyze the surface of all, all the forest. It would be better, you would have a better analysis of the trees. Uh, clouds, for example, could be a problem in any survey, clouds or fog, uh, if you want to, if you're sending the light pulses from your your sensor and there are clouds in, in between your object and your sensor, uh, it, it, in most cases uh, the, the LiDAR pulse will be stopped, it will be absorbed into the cloud. So in this sense it's difficult to, to have surveys when there, it's cloudy conditions or foggy conditions. And one more thing is uh, colorized point clouds, which can be very interesting, is where the LiDAR sensor is coupled with a photo or with a camera, and uh, each, each LiDAR point would be associated with a photo pixel. That way you can get uh, photorealistic uh, images of your point cloud. So, what are different types of LiDAR? Now, I've been talking at length about um, of different particularities of LiDAR, but now, what is aerial uh, LiDAR, for example? I had a few 
images I wanted to show you quickly, just so you can have an uh, an idea of the different. Um, see, this is aerial. This is an um, image of an aerial uh, aerial lidar. It's a, a lidar system that's mounted onto an airplane. So this is here is the mobile mobile lidar. Basically, it would be a a lidar system mounted onto a truck, or it could be even a boat or an ATV, for example. And uh, the last one here is a static terrestrial scanner that we call. I just wanted you to have an image of these different types of LiDAR. And I will continue here. So for aerial, uh, aerial LiDAR, is, there are two different types I would say. Uh, first is high altitude. This is for large scale projects like, uh, like it could be entire cities or entire forested areas for example. It w I would say it would be normally less accurate because, uh, um, for example, we're high in, high up in the air. For a, typically, I would say one one to one point five kilometers in the air could be even be even be more than that. Uh, sorry for my, <laughs> I'm t I'm speaking in kilometers. Maybe uh, let's say one mile high. Uh, typically mounted onto fixed wing aircraft. So uh, low altitude is we're going to be closer to the ground. These are higher density projects because the closer your sensor is to the ground, the more points it's going to collect on the ground. So it's going to be more accurate. And it's typically mounted on helicopters because helicopters can fly very slow or on drones. Um, Mobile data, on the other hand, is mounted on the back of a vehicle, as you've seen. And this one is very accurate. Normally, we're fairly close to our base station, and uh, it gives a better trajectory. Uh, for aerial and mobile su surveying, you're typically um, uh, connected to a base station. You, you would set up a GPS station on a fixed point that you know you have a known coordinate and you would take off for example if you're in an airplane or, or you would drive off if you're in a car and then you would return to your initial point after your survey that way everything that uh, the whole trajectory you went through to do your survey would be recorded and you could pro post process your trajectory that way you can get a precise positioning of your uh, of your scanner at all times. Uh, however, for terrestrial scanning, terrestrial scanning is static, so there's no it won't be moving during the survey. And no, normally, your scanner would do a 360 degree scan of the area. So obviously, it's the most simple uh, way of surveying. It's you. All you have to do is set up your your system onto a tripod, and it's also the least expensive way of collecting a lidar. It's also very accurate. When we're talking about least expensive, uh, some aerial uh, scanners can cost m millions of dollars. Uh, I'd say uh, maybe a bit less for the, the lower quality ones. Uh, for mobile data, we're talking. Uh, at least uh, probably a hundred thousand and however terrestrial can be more around let's say thirty thousand dollars for the for the least expensive one so here we have a, an image of some aerial data as we see it it, it kind of looks like a, uh, an aerial photo however these are shades of gray this is the intensity image i was speaking to you about earlier um, this type, like I've said, is used for large-scale projects. Um, also, classif classification. I spoke a bit about classification earlier. Is, is classifying points to different classes. There are specific ways of classifying for aerial data. So, because we're seeing objects from, from up top, 
rather than the other two methods which you're seeing objects from the ground. Uh, and high slope features can be more difficult to detect. Like for example, if we're in a mountainous area, it's going to be difficult to have an accurate uh, positioning of, uh, of the ground. Like for example, in the Grand Canyon, uh, probably that project would be much lower accuracy because the slope is so high. Normally, normally for um, for aerial uh, for mountainous uh, surveys, we're talking about maybe twenty to thirty centimeter accuracy in in our vertical uh, position. So. For mobile data, here we have an image of our mobile data, and we can see here the the scanner went a, along the road. So we have a full scan of the road, and and it captures objects that are on the side of the road as well. So it's going to be offering you much better point density on the ground. However, it's not as large scale as aerial data. Uh, the accuracy is also going to be very good. It's good for uh, road projects, for for different city planning objects. If you want to do inventory of uh, any type of sign signs or sidewalks, or this is a good option. Underpasses is also great. Uh, bridges or structures, objects that are different, uh, difficult to acquire. Uh, so if you're far from a road, for example. Uh, it might be difficult to acquire. This is why I said sometimes it's possible to have uh, a mobile uh, lidar system mounted onto an ATV, for example, which you you could you could go off into the bush and do mobile lidar scanning. But I'd say in the most part, uh, mobile lidar is done from a car or a truck. Now. Here is a, a, a snapshot of terrestrial data. Uh, terrestrial data is the least expensive. Uh, it has also very good accuracy. Uh, what's really nice about terrestrial data is the da data acquisition can be done from anywhere, even indoors. So uh, terrestrial data is really being used by, for example, architects or, or museums. They, they, they would set up a, a terrestrial scanner indoors and have a scan of the inside of a museum, for example. This can be used for, for having a snapshot, a 3D snapshot of uh, any, any indoor building. So also, uh, one particularity about static surveying is uh, that multiple surveys may be necessary because you're getting the blind zones that I spoke to you about earlier. Here we can see the scanner is behind the trees here, but we see the shadows of the trees. These are areas where we have no data at all. However, if we if we were to set up in another area here, for example, at the corner of the street, we would be able to get that missing data. This, this is a particularity because this scanner is not moving, so it's a static survey, uh, whereas the mobile and the aerial is always moving. So some common uses of LiDAR for uh, land surveyors, for example, or civil engineering, is uh, virtual surveying, as I said, is measuring within your point cloud, is picking points within your point cloud, can be very useful if you want to measure uh, objects after after you've done your survey, if you've forgotten anything, it's it's very useful. Uh, volume calculations, we can adequately measure the ground and see is there any uh, if if there are any objects that are I'll show you a bit later, um, like for example mounds of earth that you want to calculate. Uh, topographic mapping. Flood mod modeling can all be done within the, your LiDAR point cloud. Uh, civil engineering projects, for example, bridges, 
and uh, any type of uh, civil uh, structures, urban planning, um, forest planning. I know we've used that in uh, Quebec a lot because uh, we have many forests here. We have many. Uh, we have a lot of aerial surveying for uh, our forests, and with the lidar point cloud, they can they can adequately uh, estimate the the size of your for the forest. Uh, also, for building restoration, if you do a terrestrial scan on a, on a, the the walls of a building, you can see any structural damages with the lidar, which can be very useful as well. So to give you a few images of um, the different uh, applications, here we can see a volume calculation where we can see the the mound. Uh, uh, we can measure the, the volume of the, the earth mound. Topographic mapping, here we can see the, the contour lines of a, of a mountainous area. So this is something that can be done with LiDAR data. Urban planning, here we have a, an urban view of a, a, mobile, a mobile survey. So we can see buildings easily or power lines or the, the street. And uh, forest planning, this is a terrestrial scan, but normally forest planning is done from aerial survey because we want a large scale uh, survey done. But uh, LiDAR can, is very useful for measuring uh, trees. So what I'm going to show you very soon is uh, Vision LiDAR. Vision LiDAR is the program that uh, GeoPlus has developed to, uh, to uh, manipulate point clouds. Uh, it answers the growing market interest in LiDAR. As, as you'll see later on, LiDAR is very useful. Um, Vision LiDAR gives you the control over your data. So you can, sometimes people have uh, point clouds that they don't know what to do with them. Normally these are called LAS files or LAS files. So these can be easily imported into the, the software. And uh, it extends the viability of LiDAR data because you can, you can go after the fact and go to measure, measure things into your LiDAR data or you can vectorize any points that you have in your point cloud. So very simple operations. And uh, the uh, processing is automatic for, for many things, such as we have automatic classifications, uh, automatic detection of certain objects, and uh, you can vectorize your data easily. Uh, I just see there's a question. I I think I missed it. It was ten. It was ten minutes ago. Uh, what about point cloud data collected from close range photography, uh, pho photogrammetry, compared to lidar costs? Uh, close range photo photogrammetry. This is from I. I suppose uh, a drone that Tom is asking me. Um, I would say. It probably would be similar costs, however, the LiDAR is going to be able to give you much more information. Um, a drone operation, it depends really on the size of your project, but uh, a drone, f for example, would be much, much less costly than an airplane. However, I, w I would be thinking within the... It, it would really depend on the area. However, w the advantage would be really be that LiDAR gives you more flexibility and, uh, and also clients normally pref would prefer LiDAR data because they can, they can measure more things and have, they can get more information. Also, if you, it is possible to have photogrammetry and LiDAR combined. That way you would have colorized point clouds. So I'm not sure how to answer Tom's question. I would say it probably would be a similar cost. 
Okay, so now uh, we're going to continue here. Uh, I know I ha we have all these slides here for you uh, showing point registration. If you look at your, if you were to look at your uh, the presentation that was offered to you. However, I I wanted to show you directly on my uh, on my vision lidar screen instead of showing you actually the these steps. So I'm gonna open. I'm going to open my first project here and we're going to go through the point registration together and also this is so you should see on your screen right now um, you should see a point cloud of, this is actually the the front of the Geo Plus, uh, the Geo Plus office so first of all the visualization is in uh, Vision LiDAR is very easy you you can just with the mouse you can easily navigate throughout the point cloud as we can see you can change the angle you can pan easily now the first thing when you're doing a, a, a survey is you want to be able to register your scans together because here we can see that this is uh, terrestrial scanning so we have scans from four different places here. We can see this because because of these uh, these circles around our our lidar survey. Um, if I was to show you colored by scan, you would see different different colors for each scan. However, when when you do the scan, they are, they're not automatically stitched together. You have to stitch these yourself. Um, there is an option within the software to register your point cloud, which I'm going to show you right now. Um, so, for example, if I was to take my first reference point cloud here, and I was to reference it to my next one, it would look something like this. So I would have to, for example, it, there are many ways of doing this. However, uh, the, you can you can, for example, have uh, what is it targets targets that you would set up on specific coordinates. However, for for some uh, applications, it's easier to it's easier to simply pick points on the on both scans that are uh, common to both both of the scans. So if I was to view, so here we can see, I'm sorry about this, we could see both scans, here we can see So here we went. We, I went and I picked uh, points on both point clouds. We can see, for example, the point one here is the same in both. And we, I would pick at a minimum, I would say, of five points along my point cloud. And then when you validate, here you can see there's a slight difference between the points. But for this, I, this application is just. A demonstration where so we're getting two centimeters of difference maximum in X and Y which is very very uh, very acceptable for me so you, you could re-index this and, and reopen it and you will have a completely calibrated point cloud so here we can see this is when it's all stitched together. Also, uh, here is the complete building. 